Well, it's the other cape, and we like it that way. You can still find little tucked away secret hideouts, little places where people can get away from it all. I got a job here way back when. I knew I wanted to live here. It's not as developed as Cape Cod. So when you come up the 128, it's all wooded and everything. All your stress kinds goes away. If you say you're headed to the Cape for the weekend, you're not headed here. While the Bay State's larger Cape and Islands are world famous, Cape Ann has long been labeled the other Cape, but with its own long and colorful history, relative quiet, natural beauty, and fairly minimal development, that label ain't so bad. 30 plus miles north of Boston, Cape Ann also marks the northern edge of Massachusetts Bay, an island until only the 1950s when it was finally bridged with Route 128. It's home to three towns and one city, Gloucester, America's oldest seaport and in many ways still Cape Ann's hometown. We are a fishing town. It's a tight-knit community. Sense of pride is amazing. I mean, we live in a beautiful place. The seaside beauty here has never diminished or faded. Sadly, the same can't be said of this fishing town's fishing fleet. Decades of crushing regulations and shifting markets have reduced what was once a thriving harbor of hundreds of boats to about 60 today. On a good day, Joe Sanfilippo's family goes back generations as Gloucester fishermen. How many fishermen do you know who've been put out of work? Hundreds and hundreds. Who put 20 years into a career and had to change. It's, um, it's devastating. Joe Sanfilippo was one of those fishermen. Today, he's captain and engineer on the local Gloucester cruise boat, Boatport, but he's also started Extreme Gloucester Fishing, a learning center designed to both teach sustainable fishing practices as well as help with job placement. The mission is to create new fishermen, create jobs. The generational pipeline is gone. It's gone. San Filippo admits he misses fishing, but feels equally passionate now about teaching it. It's really important because once you lose what we have here, you're not gonna get it back. This knowledge will never return. Once lost, you won't get it back. While fishing made Gloucester famous, there is another equally longtime companion community here that also has helped define Cape Ann in an equally challenging, if not quite as perilous profession, artists. The fishermen were obviously here first, but the artists since the 19th century were drawn to this area, then this relationship between the two, they just learned to live and work together. Artists like Winslow Homer, Edward Hopper, Fitzhenry Lane, all attracted to Gloucester and the inspiration of its harbor, its working seascapes, and the unique and often arresting light of Cape Ann. Today, Gloucester's rocky neck still is a haven for galleries and artists like Andy Matlow, a sculptor who continues that tradition in Gloucester. Well, everyone speaks of the light, of course. It's just special. I feel like I've lived here all my life, and I've only lived here five years. Artist John Sloan painted in Gloucester for several summers starting in 1914. Among the subjects he was drawn to most, the ruggedly wild, fabled, and forbidding area inland on Cape Ann, Dogtown. Dogtown was a place that history ended, at least in terms of the people that lived here hundreds of years ago. Sort of the mystery of the place that is part of this quality that attracts a lot of people to, to the center of the Cape. Gloucester resident Mark Carlotto has researched and written about Dogtown Commons, as it was called, when a community thrived here in the decades before the American Revolution. Gloucester's male population was decimated by the war. One rumor is that the place got to be known as Dogtown because of the dogs that roamed the dogs that protected the, the women that lived here. Now, grown over with woods, relics of the past can still be found. So, Mark, cellar hole of a former house here in Dogtown. Yes, yes. This is a mystery about the place, and it spooks some people out. Some people don't like to come into the woods by themselves. That may or may not explain the three friends that Frank Lane was biking with on this day in Dogtown. Do you ever find that sense of eeriness that a lot of people often say they feel about Dogtown? Yeah, yeah, you do. There's some dark secrets around this, these areas, I guess. At least you're on a bike, you can get out quick. That's right. <laughs> Not that I'd want to get in front of these guys, mind you. And with over three and a half thousand acres of trees, trails, and roads in Dogtown, there's 
a lot of room to spread out. Dogtown is huge in a completely different world. Two different worlds indeed. One wooded, one water, on one cape. Visitors to Dogtown today don't see the area as the artist John Sloan did when he painted it in the early 1900s. Back then it was mostly meadow with open grazing land. Today woods have overtaken most of the 3,000 plus acres. Hikers who look closely can still find shards of pottery and other small artifacts of the long gone community of Dogtown Commons. Coming up, this is No Fishtail. 